So let's talk now about how to create the mafia offer in Lithuanian circumstances. Now first, why we started to talk about Lithuanian circumstances? Because quite often we hear the comments that, okay, you know, I've read the book, but it won't work here because it's about America, it's about the United States, it's about other countries and industries and so on and so on. By the way, who is here from production company? Please raise the hand. Okay, from the production company, who have read the goal? Okay, what do you think about the, that book? Does it sound like common sense? Yeah. Would it work in your company? Have you implemented something? Um, yes. <laughs> no. Goldratt used to joke, Dr. Elie Goldratt used to joke that the, the goal is the production bike. Because most of the people have read it. Most of them fully agree with what's written there. And most of them do not follow that. Why? Because they are different. So, when we talk about the mafia offers and the sales and changes in sales, well, first of all, why we talk about some change, especially in sales? No, because in a strong wind, even turkeys can fly. So when you remember, most of the companies still remember 2007, 2008. Yeah. When there was a queue of customers standing, six weeks, normal lead time, yes? And you really didn't do the sales, you just, what, what you were doing, order taking. Huh? So it's easy to sell. Now, more and more major competitive advantage, and which was presented by Ernst & Young in the morning, major competitive advantage, low salary levels, are disappearing. So, we need to start doing something different. Huh? So, we need to think how to fly without the strong wind. So, let's do the reality check. First of all, the question is, do you have some spare capacity at the company? And that was the question, can you accommodate without reducing customer service 20% more sales? By the way, I think the half of those who raised their hands, when you really got 20% 20 more, 20 more of the sales, you suddenly would realize that, oops, we are not as good as we thought. Yes, and the, the graph Alan presented, when you are just a little bit below 80% of utilization of your bottleneck, and you are still doing okay, and suddenly a big jump with the orders brings a big chaos. Another question is, who owns more than 20% of market share? Please raise the hand. Okay. <coughs> Finally, because for like 10 years I was hearing from many companies Lithuanian market is too small. We cannot do anything. It's only 3 million people and so on and so on. Finally, at least here we have the crowd who thinks that there is no such thing as Lithuanian market. Why? Because at least we are part of small confederation called European Union. Yes? At least. And if you look at the world market, even uh, Walmart, which is not very small company, and I've checked that they have more employees in Walmart when, uh, than there is working people. Okay. So if you really have some spare or free capacity and your market share is not more than 20%, so you really have an opportunity to grow. And your constraint is sales. And it's a, some kind of mix up of the um, terminology. Because sometimes you say, okay, constraint is in the market. And 
And some people assume that it's okay, not big enough market, so we need to expand. But again, market is really big enough. Basically, we need to think how to sell more. So, okay, we have spare capacity, constraint is in the market. So, let's go and sell, yes? Go and sell, go and sell. And everything looks like clear, but uh, very known phrase. Houston, yes? we have problem. What kind of problem? First of all, more, many companies and what the results of the uh, benchmarking survey shows, that especially in Lithuania, many companies are not as good as sell at selling. I usually say there are two types of sales strategies. Okay? One sales strategy, very common in Lithuania, I call it kiosk strategy. <laughs> you know what is the kiosk sales strategy? You have the kiosk, you have some goods there, and you hope that there will be people standing in the queue wanting your product. Yes. And when we started, when crisis started, we worked with one of the companies and we worked with the sales, their sales department, and I said one of the first questions, how many sales calls you have today? I said, no. How come? You know, crisis, nobody is calling. <laughs> There is no customer. Yes? Have you tried to dial the, the phone to, to call your customer? No, no, it's, it's not the way we do business here. You don't understand. So, let's look into the some, well, uh, sometimes we call it holy cows in the sales. I was told that it's not very politically correct to call it holy cows. Then we switch to myths, yes? So let's talk about some myths in sales and marketing. And uh, myth number one, we, Lithuanian small, medium businesses, the company, you put your name here, we are different. Because you, you, well, you know, the first thing what we hear typically when we meet the prospect is, okay, we know your credentials, you know, we know you've done some things, we know that you have some results, but you should understand one thing. You should forget everything you've done before because we are different. And we already made one small test how different we are. Because when you started to write your sales selling points, why you're different, yes? So let's check how different we are, small and medium business in Lithuania. Let's go through the very unique list of problems which we hear from very unique customers. Very strong competition. Competition is really squeezing us on prices. It is impossible to find good salespeople. The only thing customers are talking about and they are asking for is discounts and discounts. It, it is hard to balance cash flow of the company. And typically, especially for small businesses, the owner has to work 24-7. So, very unique problems. Who has at least one of those unique problems? Please raise your hand. So others who don't have any problems with sales, why are you here? Why don't 
why are you wasting your attention and time? When we talk about we are different and we are uniqueness, Lisa presented Mafia offer from one of the American label printers. Oh, by the way, this offer is so unique that it was firstly published in uh, It's Not Black, or here in Lithuania we call that book The Goal Number Two, yes, like 20 years ago. And I will show you later that there is one Lithuanian company who managed to replicate that party off. Suddenly they said, no, we are not so unique, let's try it. Maybe it will work. But very often, many times, it is our thinking that we are different. Yes. When we start looking at the symptoms, they are not so unique. The things we do, they are not so unique. Yes. And the results we get, somehow, they are not so unique. Yes. And by the way, we really different. Is it a bad thing to be different? And we talk about significant competitive advantage in order to sell more at the higher price. Yes. What does it mean, significant competitive advantage? That we do something much better than the competitors. And much better means what? We are different. So if you we or if you as a company is really different, as you claim, are you really exploiting that thing? Because there is one small company, maybe you don't know that name, they, their advertising slogan was about difference. Can you guess the name of the company? Yes. So being different is not a bad thing. But thinking that you are different and being the same, that's a bad thing. And before coming to this conference in the car with Alan, we had some discussion. And about other situations when we talk, when we do inventory management implementations, and they say that quite often people working with inventory management and orders, they say, well, I know better than the software what to do. And I said, well, typically we try to say, yes, you know better, but trust the system and do as the system says. And Alan said, no. It's not the right way to do. You say to the people, no, you don't know better. So it's, well, maybe you need to be more polite, but you know, most of the TLC consultants, myself as well, they are not very famous of putting things in very soft manner. Yes, we are some, sometimes we are very blunt. But if you are really different, and you are standing out of the crowd, so do you know how to <coughs> exploit that difference? The problem is that most of the times you are absolutely more or less the same as others. So, the second myth, it relates to this kiosk strategy. If you have really good product or service, customer will find it. So you just sit and wait. And then complain, nobody's calling. Yes, you can survive with that strategy in one case, when there is, then you have something 
people really have to have by water supply or electricity. And there is only one supply. So then you don't need to do the active sales. Anyway, people will come to you. Yeah, but it, it is not enough to be good. Why? Because some clients probably just don't know you exist at all. We are in the Lithuanian market doing the consulting for already 10 years. And we consider ourselves quite active in the sales and marketing and promotion and so on. And quite often I meet the companies, not small ones, who never heard about us in Lithuania. So even after 10 years of quite active marketing, some, some PR and other things, conferences like that and so on, still, so some clients do not know you exist at all. Okay, typically, uh, we know that you have to sell some, some solution to the problem. Client's problem. But many clients do not realize they have the problem you can solve. Especially if you have something like more innovative. Even if we talk about project management solution, the, the sales we do, yeah? critical chain. And when you talk to the typical construction company or IT company, then you say, okay, the project has to fit into three requirements, yes? On specs, quality, on time, and in budget. Yes. When I worked in an IT company, my software developers, programmers had a big banner on their door saying, we do high quality, low price, high speed. Yeah. And then small print, you can choose one out of three. <laughs> yeah, but when you talk to them, everybody understands that. But then you say, do you face the, the problem that you are over the budget? Or that the schedule and cannot achieve the planned specs. Yes, but that's not a problem. <laughs> Why not a problem? Because everybody does that, so it's normal. Do you have some problems with the multitasking and conflicts regarding some uh, resources? Do you think that? Yes, but that's that's normal. You know, I have to fight with my colleague. Or there's some scared resource. That, that, that's not a problem. Most of them, it's, for them, it's fact of life. Okay, another thing could be that your clients do not know you are better than others. Because the, the things you say, we are one of the leading companies. Just go, it's like you went to the, your competitor's site, website, and copied. What they say about them, well, just put it there. Yes. And of course, some clients do not see or understand the value of your offer. Because cost mentality is very strong. Yeah? We need to get discounts, discounts, discounts. Quite often, when some sales person calls as a uh, manager of the company, so I'll get some sales calls. And if I have time, differently from the normal people, yes, I talk to the sales people. Yes. Not that I don't say I don't have time, because I try to learn how not to sell most of the time. And quite often, before starting to talk about what they want to offer, they start with, this week we have special discount promotion. Asked about this kind of price, yes. No, but if you start with the discount, so what's about the value? 
Okay, so if we are about, not everybody sees the value and understands our offer, so there is a myth, a third myth. It's about more marketing and quite many things, especially in, uh, in small and medium enterprises, that marketing is about branding. Because you can sell at a higher price only in one case. When your brand is really known. I had some uh, uh, furniture company who started to work and they said, we want to build European brand so we can sell more. I said, well, I'm, I'm not sure that at this stage it's, it's a right thing. No, no, no. So they went to some European uh, marketing agency just to talk. So the first like step in building a European brand was, okay, so we'll do some research analysis, we'll create some directions and so on. So basically, you have 10 million euros. It's like a first step. Um, before they said, okay, marketing is about branding. And we cannot, cannot afford it. But marketing, especially in business to business area, is not only about branding. Okay, branding always helps. But there is a challenge. Especially when we are dealing in business to business area. So that when the details of an offer are not clearly laid out, it is easy to turn even the best sales offer into the best. And uh, I have some training program for small and medium enterprise owners. And one of the on, on one of the lectures is like, okay, tell me in one or two, okay, three sentences, what do you sell? What do you do? So I can really understand what's your value. We solve customer problems. Oh, great. Very unique and understandable. Or, okay, what, what can you offer? And then you get, as Dr. Ellie used to say, these stories and mumbo jumbo, and you don't understand. Because the problem is when, when the details of the offer are not constructed, to mitigate risks and ensure benefits to both clients and the company, the outcome may be losing many good sales opportunities and or losing profit margins. When I don't see the clear benefits of the offer, I feel somehow that it could be useful for my company, but I don't see any really clear benefits. What I do, I try to press the price down as low as possible. And we shouldn't forget uh, there was analysis and research done quite a long time ago uh, about the psychology of uh, the one who buys your products or services. It's really interesting that when the person buys for himself as a private person, he really tries to maximize price-benefit ratio. But when the person buys for the company as a part of the company, he turns into the so-called satisficer mode. Really interesting. What does it mean, satisfaction? For him, it's not a benefits price ratio is the most important thing. For him, the most important thing is reducing or even avoiding the risks. If you work with a big company, yeah, they are not changing their suppliers very easily and very fast. Why? 
Because the change of supply brings a lot of turbulence in the company. It creates lots of risks. So we really need to think about reducing the risks to the company and our company as well when we present the offer. Yes, benefits are very important, a value, but reducing the risks is even more important. Another very important thing is when you sell to the wrong prospects. If you are selling the airbrush to the bold man, You can think that the hairbrush you're selling is a bad product. Because the bold, bold people are not buying it. So pursuing world prospects is not just a waste of valuable resources, money, capacity, time, but it can lead to the conclusion that the direction of or the offer is invalid. From my personal experience, Long time ago, I was working in one of the IT companies. And that company was really a leader at that time, in which sense they created a very new product at that time. The offer to the small and medium companies of outsourcing IT department. Which is now quite normal that you don't have an IT guy in your company, you have some com from IT company doing the IT, small IT stuff you need. But at that time it was something really new. And they, the pricing was really good. The value was there. And they did proper job. And they went to sell. First month, two contracts. Okay, you know, you need to take long lead time and so on and so on. Second month, one contract. Third month, two contracts. Well, five contracts within three months with their uh, you know, infrastructure uh, doesn't sound like a good business. Why not? Again, let's check the value of the offer and everything. And we check that everything is okay. Then, finally, we started to look into how do they sell and to whom do they sell the offer? Okay. So, just, this is the IT company offer about IT department or IT work. Who's the contact person they were talking to? IT guy, the chief of the IT department. <laughs> And the offer to that guy sounds, hey, we have a beautiful solution which makes you redundant in the company. Or oh, not so important. <laughs> surprise, surprise the results, yes? So who is the right per prospect at this time? I have to be the owner or top manager of the company. So, quite often we see working with the clients that they have right offer for the right company, but they are talking to the wrong person in the company. So, it's really important when you have your mafia offer, uh, which was presented by, by Lisa, how to, how to do this mafia offer, go a little bit into that. But you really need to understand to what kind of companies this would be interesting. First, and whom to talk in that company. So before we go and sell, marketing has to make sure, and marketing is not necessarily, it's a department. By the way, a few years ago I had a talk uh, with uh, marketing director of the one of the biggest Lithuanian companies, oh. cons consumer product companies. 
and she said, I do see that in the, especially in the companies, very few top marketing guys or top uh, marketing managers are men, mostly women. Well, I didn't do the statistics, but I will trust you what you are saying. So, do you know why? Okay, tell me. Because you cannot build the monument for yourself in marketing, which is very important for men, not so important for women. Why? Because when the sales increase, who is doing the, their job right? Sales. Yes. When the sales go down, whose fault is that? Market. Yes. So everything good is sales. It's because sales did the right job. Yeah. And if something goes wrong, it's a marketing. So when we talk about business to business sector, and uh, when we talk about uh, small and medium enterprises, the Marketing part is first of all detailing and understanding our target market. <coughs> to whom we will sell. And then to have detailed offer to the target market. And when we talk about to whom we will sell, we really need to think not only about What's his position? But what kind of person is that? And how to get his attention? And how to get attention of right people? Okay. Now there is a very nice joke about getting the attention. And uh, in TLC we say that selling on emotions is not really working. But Sometimes we use some emotion tricks. Why? It's a story when uh, one uh, person who lived in the mountains and he had a very small nice donkey as his friend. And the only problem was donkey does not talk. And that man was living only with donkey. He wanted just sometimes to not only to talk to, but to have some comments back. And when he wants, he goes to the marketplace and suddenly sees this big sign. I teach the dinkies to talk. Okay, good. He comes to the trader and says, you know, I'm ready to pay whatever price you say, but, very small but, I really love that donkey. Please don't use any physical methods to teach me. Oh, no, no, no. During the teaching, learning process, I don't use any physical things. You know. Really, really. Okay. I agree. I love that donkey. But, you know, he has some bad worries on his heart. <coughs> so he stands around the corner and watches what happens. And this trainer takes a big hammer, as we say, two by four, comes to that donkey and hits the donkey in the, in the head. And the, the guy runs, comes and says, you promised not to do any physical things to my donkey. So during the training process, I will not do anything to him. But first, I need to get his attention. <laughs> <laughs> so of course, sometimes we need to do some emotional things. And again, doing the emotional things, we need to adjust those to the right people. A few days ago, one week ago, now it's everywhere, in Facebook, even in, in newspapers, this article, this advertising, probably everybody seen that. Okay, big letters, sex. <laughs> then small print, now when we got your attention, we would like to offer the our services on painting the walls and fixing some other things, yes? And now they are not happy that they are not getting right calls. Yeah. People call with other hopes. 
So, what, where is the problem? They got attention, but not the right people's attention. <laughs> we really need to think how to at attract right people's attention. Because as I say, if a person doesn't have any problems there, well, you will not at attract it. Because, for example, I learned that Lego is selling in Lithuania like a year ago. Yes. It was a surprise for me. Oh. 20 years? Oh, Lego again. Yes. Why I one year ago learned about Lego? Because appeared the problem connected to Lego. Well, I have, suddenly I have one Lego user at home. <laughs> so, coming back to we need to have the target market to whom, and we need to know our DD offer. So, the myth number four in the sales. The myth says selling is an art. And only artists can do it. You have to be touched by God <laughs> to be able to sell. Something you either have or don't. Yeah, there is some, some small thing. There is some touch of art in the selling. I think Alex will talk about how much art is in the selling uh, later. So I will leave that. Okay, so when we talk about marketing and sales, so marketing has to build the valuable offer and build the awareness to your offer. Sales have to convert that demand into the deals. They have to close the deals. And when we talk about uh, major sales, not minor sales, but major sales, we say that uh, there are several characteristics of major sales. First of all, it typically it's long uh, sales cycle. It has more than one meeting and different steps have to happen before we get the contract. The prospect, the person we're talking, must consult with others prior to making the decision. So if we convince him only on the emotional level, it will not work. Significant debates about the purchasing considerations occur between the meetings when the salesperson is not present. Most major sales entail continuous relationship with the prospect. If you're selling business to business, yes. then uh, typically the prospect assumes that if the deal is done, he have, will have to see that salesperson again. And if he doesn't like that salesperson, he will not be so much willing to have the deal. And it's different than from when you're selling shoes. Even if your salesperson is not the best one, but if the shoes are right, people will buy the shoes and they will leave. Because when they have the shoes, they don't have to have any connections with the, that salesperson. And major sale means a major decision. If the decision is wrong, it also means a major mistake. People really are looking to reduce the risks or buy. Why? Because it's their reputation on stake. They don't want to risk their reputation. So when you do the major sale, I have to overcome resistance to change. First of all, you can do uh, 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 you can do rational persuasion uh, because there are lots of rational things. You have to peel the layers of resistance, and I will show them. Or you can see and meet some irrational, um, emotional, or psychological resistance to change. We will touch only rational part. Yeah. So. In TOC, we, we talk it about layers of resistance, that you have to peel each layer like an onion. 
So again, the process is very simple. What to change, what to change to, and how to post the change. First of all, typically when you come to sell to somebody, first of all, if you have the solution to the problem, so what customer needs to have, he needs to have the problem. And even when he has a problem, he needs to understand that this is the problem. So, first layer of resistance is, I don't have a problem. You really need to show that his life could be much better. Make bigger profits and so on. Then, okay, I have a problem, but no, no, you don't understand, I'm different. My problem is somewhere else. I need to show him that this is his core problem. And quite often companies fall into the, as uh, one book said, into victimity <coughs> trap. Yes? What is the victimity trap? Oh, yes, this is the problem, but we cannot do anything about that. And when, and when I do the sales, sometimes I hear, oh, you know, you're talking about doubling the profits. Oh, it's easy. I can do it myself as well. If somebody reduces the raw material price for me, or the government will reduce the taxation, or our major customers will start paying higher price. When we talk about things like that, which doesn't depend on us. So, we cannot change anything. But when we thought problem is out of my control, it's a very good stage. When you can say, yes, you cannot control that part and those problems, because we, as a suppliers, behave badly. Now we are ready to change. It's like <laughs> men do with the women. Yeah. Yes, my fault, I will change. But this time we really mean it. <laughs> okay, so when we read about the problem and we can do something about that, okay, so what is the solution of the problem? Then we need to show that the solution addresses at least bigger part of the problem than it substantial benefits, we mitigated possible risks of new solution, and sometimes mitigating the risk is very, very, very important. Most important part. Yeah. <coughs> and we know how to overcome obstacles during the implementation of the new solution. 90% of the cases it's enough to get the deal. Sometimes you get uh, irrational fears, but most of the cases, this is enough. So let's go and look into the Lithuanian examples of mafia offers. I just selected two. Those offers, one is, was presented in details during the, our supply chain conference one year ago. So if you go to the <laughs> versalacademia.lt, register there, you'll be able to see presentation of the company by themselves in full length, how they did it and, and, and so on. And by the way, that presentation is in Lithuania. Okay, so just before starting uh, it going into Lithuanian examples, I just couldn't help myself just place one of the examples of Mafia offer. One of the TOC consultants implemented in the, some, again, US company. But on the regular terms of delivery, this is their guarantee that they are reliable. They say, for the first day we are late, you get 
30% discount from initial price. For the second day, it's another 20% from initial price. Other days, 10% each. So, basically, if we are late for one week, you get delivery free. I do you think, can their competitors copy that offer? How many of you are ready to say to, their ter to those terms, uh, lead times, quoted lead times, you, you are quoting your customers, that kind of guarantee? Okay, not 30%, 5% discount for the first day we are late. What does it mean? It means guys taking their promises really seriously, yes? As in Russia they say, Zabazar <laughs> Atvichai. That, 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 that's a... Okay, so I'll go through the example Lisa talked. It was published in the that book. Who, who read that book? Raise your hand. So you will know the Matthew offered the case. Yes. That's a company called Aurica. Lithuanian label printer. That's part of their presentation. They are given, this is the slides of their presentation they have given uh, one year ago in the conference. Yeah, they are producer of label and packaging, modern and reliable partner. Now I think more employees, annual sales, customers, yes. 2,600 orders per month on average. Not very small production. So what they offered, the same uh, offer, we will take care of your inventory of labels. Don't give us orders. Just give us daily consumption. Why? Because the same problems as Lisa said, shortage in warehouse. Some, some labels run out faster than expected. Some labels are too much. For example, I was a few years ago visiting one of the uh, sweets factory, yes, candies factory, and in their warehouse of raw materials and so on, I saw the, some packaging which said, welcome to new millennium. <laughs> Cost of purchase management. Somebody had to take care of look and make the orders. Human factor. Oh, you know, we ran out of that label a few weeks ago, or a few months ago. So now I have to be sure, yes, so let's increase the order by factor of five, or things like that. Or sometimes people just do forget what to order. So what they, offered, what they were offering, Inventory should be managed by technology and by suppliers. Technology. technology should be clear, simple, user-friendly, specialized by function. So they used uh, dynamic buffer management with the software called StockM. Uh, and of course they face during the implementation. They come to the company, they offer now we will ensure, basically we will become your supplier of labels like you have with the water. When you need the water, what do you do? You make the forecast, you order. No, what do you do? You just open the tap and it's there. So they said, we'll make sure whenever you need the labels, you go to your warehouse and it's there. Of course, first of all, 
sometimes said, well, it's, it, it happens only in the books. You won't be able to be so confident, so reliable. I said, okay, let's have a pilot with some part of the labels. I'll see, does it work? How it works? And what are results? And they, they launch. And the, because benefits for the customers. Well, packaging is cheap. If you look at the typical producer package products, the label, the cost of the label and the cost of the product is less than 1%. Yeah, but if you ordered too much and you have to throw away, everything you throw away, it is too much. <coughs> so if you order too much, you have surplus in the warehouse, you have to throw away, bad cash flow could be <coughs> when small orders, fires, when your order is not enough, and fires, again some low sales, replanning of the production. Now, have you ever been to the production manager at the moment when he learns that he has to replan his production just because of some supplier has not delivered something as promised? Everybody says that construction site workers swear. Never heard uh, really the production manager story yes? in these cases. And about reliability of the forecasts. Who does the sales forecast? Who, who, who needs to do the sales forecast out of this crowd? Yeah. And how it's going? How you are good at that? Yeah. You know why God created the sales forecast? In order weather forecast looks good. <laughs> so um, basically the uh, sales not, not uh, the, the clients really faces the what should they do? Increase? Impossible? Comma, we need to decrease. We have to put the common. So the offer was customer inventory management or with uh, dynamic buffer management uh, principles. Yes? Of course, from customers were reactions. Okay? And the pilot. So this how the average stock of one of the SKUs looked like. Yeah? You can see that here was at this level almost around 8,000. Then at the, the end of the project, they managed the same. They managed the same availability at almost the half of the inventory levels. Now, lower storage cost. Amount of labels increased by 48 percent, almost by half. Better cash flow. Inventory decreased. Uh, uh, by 37, the value increased by 37 percent. Was a little bit increased the price of the labels. Low stable purchase management caused 46 orders without, almost without involvement from the customer side. We just the, the producer just delivered. That's it. Required items at the right time. Zero sh shortages or fires during the pilot project term and better planning and packaging expenses because all the labels are fixed price. Because before, if you order a small batch, your label price is higher. If you order a big batch, the price is lower. Now you have fixed price. So what they wanted to achieve? To manage and optimize inventory flow at the customer's warehouse with no load, additional work to the customer accounting system and no changes. Optimize our production process, improve production planning and inventory control. With some customers, they face the problem uh, that some clients do not have daily consumption of the labels. most of the producers, they, when they're using the label, 
they, they basically calculate how much they used once a month. So they had to adjust their offer. They had to adjust their offer and they had the solution even how to overcome this risk and obstacle. So another example is from a very small business. It's uh, one of the participants of the program of Amato Prevenzlo, the program for uh, small uh, and medium enterprises. By the way, the creator of that offer is here, and I will show him, you can talk to him. And basically, uh, they are selling everything for the roofing. Yes? So, what they did, they analyzed their segments. And I just had a screenshot from the website or internet. What they did, they analyzed their, uh, their segments. Who, are, are, who is buying their products? First was the ones, the professionals, who really do the roofing. Yes, contractors. And other segment is really the private people who really are building their own houses. So what they, they said, okay, for, for those who are professionals, the, the more focused professional is on the just doing the roof and less running in the shops and looking what to find, where to find some screws and everything. The more he is doing the roofing, the more money he makes. So the offer was tailored. Just we supply you everything you need. And even with the some clients, you just go climb on the roof and do the roofing. For others, for the private people, they are not so much professional. Quite often happens what? You bought too much what was needed. So why you try to discuss about the discounts? Because if you have to throw away, you want this what you throw away to be the, at the lower price. What they said, anything is left and you don't need, bring us back. We'll buy it back at the same price you bought it. So don't worry, buy, buy more. And when you have more, when you need, what happens? You can still mostly more. Because huh? when you have, okay, maybe we will need a little bit more some nails or screws. But, uh, well, it will take another three hours to find it. Okay, maybe we'll use less. When they have enough, or even more, so they use more, and they promise quite a lot of things. And what they say is, we are ready to put guarantees and money back guarantees and everything in the contract. It's not only that we promise that on our website. We're ready to put it in the contract and sign it. So it is possible to do, or for example, I had the uh, when crisis started, they had lots of calls from IT companies trying to sell to us the website. Your website is too old and we have 50% discount, so you need to buy the website. So, well, honestly, I don't need the website. I have one, but it's too old. The colors are not right. Oh, I started business in order to have the website with the right colors. And I don't need a discount. Show me how much more money I would make. Hmm. One of the companies came like, okay, we are ready to give you like three websites and you will pay for each uh, lead, sales lead that comes from website. Okay. So what what why it's not a mafia offer? So the last question, not the last, one of the very important questions is, it's again about the frame of mind. And Alan quoted uh, Ford, if you think, 
if you believe you can't, or you believe you can, in both cases you are right. So what is your frame of mind? Because typically we see the companies three possible, one of, out of three possible ways. It, some are ambitious companies. They're ambitious and really unhappy and frustrated with their situation now. They want more. They want to grow. They, they feel they're missing the opportunities and they're really focusing on growth and expanding business. That's one of the part of our clients. Another part of our clients is the companies who are really in crisis. If this doesn't work, so probably it means we are out of business. Because still, for many companies, uh, TOC and not so much lean, but even lean, is considered as a something not uh, really scientific approach and although we always stress that we are using very scientific approach but it's still like you know witch doctors and magic and maybe even some kind of religious cult yes. and, and there is a bigger part or chunk of the companies and they are not our clients during the projects. Yeah, they, they clients for conferences or some training, but that's a complaint complacent companies. Life is good. Yeah, well, we're growing five percent a, a year. Yeah, market is growing by twenty-five percent, but it's okay. Yeah. The problem is with the uh, suppliers, they're selling too high raw material and yeah, but still life is okay. It will not change because we're different. Once again, it's your choice. Which is your state of mind? Are you ambitious? Or are you in the crisis? Because if life is good, okay. Life is good. Okay, you can find more information at, uh, as I mentioned, personalacademia.t. It's a lot of, a lot of video material, a lot of articles uh, and our website, company's website, toc.lt. By the way, the article by Ellie Goldman standing on the shoulders of giant about uh, uh, production management, you can find the translation in Lithuanian on our website, toc.lt, and you can find their link to the original English version. Well, we have the website for small and medium business, it's called Amber, and of course our blog, Common Sense, where me and Lindogas and others and some other guys are right.